All right, so um, for my second and final story, I want to move closer to home, although this isn't um, quite so close um, still, but um, the Hubble Space Telescope just celebrated its 25th anniversary. So um, I can't remember which day um, in April of um, 1990. Uh, it might be 24th? Thanks, Steve. So April 24th, 1990. Um, Almost exactly 25 years ago, um, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched from the bay of the um, Space Shuttle Discovery. And you might remember there were issues with the uh, focus of the telescope, but that's all been fixed now. And um, astronomers have been extremely happy about the amount of work and science that has come out of um, Hubble. And so every year on its anniversary, the um, Hubble um, science team um, releases a um, gorgeous image of something um, out, out in the heavens um, to um, get people excited about, about Hubble all again. And um, last week, or this past week, they released um, this image of a star forming region called um, Westerlund 2. And uh, I'll talk. Um, and so you can actually go online and find extremely high resolution versions of this image now. I think the highest one is in excess of 8,000 pixels across. And um, yeah, this projector only shows a little bit over 1,000 pixels, and um, we're not going to see all the detail. Uh, but um, we'll, uh, what I'll do in this final story is just talk um, a little bit about what we're seeing here in this image. So before um, we do that, I want to go into um, a, uh, a little bit of background about um, what I call galactic ecology. The fact that in our galaxy, stars are being born, they live, and they die. And this process um, can be seen in, in its various stages in different parts of the galaxy. So the one that um, I'm going to focus on is the... Um, the part where we um, have giant molecular clouds. These are um, dark um, clouds in our galaxy. And these are places that are cold enough and dense enough that portions of um, those clouds can collapse to form stars. And so here you're seeing um, a very dense um, region inside um, that cloud that have collapsed to form a bunch of protostars. And these stars, um, once they turn on, they can generate winds and outflows. Um, in, in a similar but not exactly the same way that um, black holes um, that we talked about earlier can generate outflows. So even though gravity is pulling gas towards the center and um, piling up into these young protostars, um, a lot of that gas is actually expelled out as well. And so what happens is that these stars can, through the action of their winds and their outflows, and to some extent also ultraviolet radiation, can gradually destroy the surrounding cloud. And so over time, what can happen is that instead of having um, stars being surrounded by the gas, which um, makes it difficult for us to observe them, you then have a naked um, cluster of stars. But what can also happen is that if you have not just low mass stars like our sun forming, but also massive stars, stars that are at least eight times the mass of our sun, these stars have huge amounts of ultraviolet radiation, and the winds are also much, much more powerful. And not only can these stars re really do a good job of blowing out the molecular cloud, um, but they ionize, their UV radiation ionizes the gas. So you actually um, have a bubble of 10,000 degree gas that these stars are floating in. And over time, these massive stars also blow up in supernovas. And so the supernova um, in, um, can also tend to destroy or disrupt these clouds. And once you don't have the gravity of these clouds holding these clusters together, the stars then disperse as they orbit around the galaxy. So we think our sun was formed in places like these dark clouds, and whether um, they formed in places where there were, weren't any uh, massive stars or in places where there um, were massive stars, that's um, a question that hasn't been answered yet. But what we're seeing um, in that image oh, um, of uh, Westerland 2 is one of these uh, regions where uh, you're getting, getting enormous amounts of star formation um, with massive stars. Now, 
this um, schematic shows um, our Milky Way galaxy and it shows the location of our sun. So here's the center of our galaxy about 26,000 light years away and um, our galaxy is what's known as a borrowed sparrow. So it has these sparrow arms that make up the pinwheel like pattern in the disk of the galaxy but there's also this bar at the center. And the density of the, um, of the stars is greatest at the center and it kind of drops off. So we're kind of in the suburbs. We're not really in the busy core of the center of the galaxy. And along um, this artist's depiction, you can see lots of dark features, these dark lanes along the spiral arms. Those are the giant molecular clouds, the dark clouds that stars are born from. And um, we think that our sun is um, part of um, what we call the Orion Spur of uh, the Sagittarius arm. So this is the Sagittarius arm. It goes out to here. And um, actually the Sagittarius arm is here, but there's also something known as the Carina arm. And we think that um, there's a lot of evidence that the Sagittarius and the Carina arm are one and the same. But um, we are just off of that on um, something known as the Orion Spur. But the, um, the Westerlund II um, feature that um, was imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope is basically in this direction. So it's um, in the direction of Carina. Um, the Carina arm is named after the constellation Carina. And so if um, we were looking out in the sky, that's where we, we, we would be looking. But there's still a lot of uncertainty about exactly how far away um, that particular star forming region is. And so, as you can see, there um, even there are actually two papers that came out in um, just a couple years ago, within months of each other, that had huge discrepancies between um, the estimated um, distance. And so, um, this the end of this bar here is about 9,000 light years from the sun, and the most distant part of this yellow bar is about 13,000 light years. So, um, even though um, we have a lot of good telescopic observations. There's um, still uncertainty, and in fact, some of the um, earlier papers have it um, be as much as 26,000 light years. So you know it could even be out here. Um, but let's um, go ahead and look at this region, um, not with the Hubble Space Telescope, but um, seeing how it looks like um, from the ground. Um, this region. Um, isn't as spect spectacular in visible light because there is a lot of molecular gas that sort of hides or obscures the stars. Um, but when we look in, um, start looking in the infrared, um, infrared light allows us to sort of peer through a lot of that obscuration, the obscuring gas and dust. And in this case, this is a um, survey that was done um, at um, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst back in the, the 90s. And um, so here um, is that um, the central grouping of stars and we're seeing um, glow from um, emission in the um, near infrared. And you can see that there's a very bright and dense cluster of stars and there's um, uh, there are fewer stars, although there's still um, considerable numbers of stars all around. But what we'll do is um, we're going to go further into the infrared. And as you get further into the infrared, you can actually um, peer even deeper. And let's see what happened here. Did I accidentally mute it? Oh, OK, here we go. I did. Um, so this is um, taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and instead of um, the wavelengths of the light being uh, anywhere from one to two microns, um, which is um, about 10 to 20 times longer than the wavelengths of light that our um, eyes are sensitive to, um, we are going to three um, to six and eight microns. And so you're still seeing uh, that, and, and this is kind of the distant view, so very similar to the, um, this um, shape in, in this Im image. And then the two views at the bottom are zooming in to that central cluster. So as we go um, deeper into the infrared, we're actually seeing more and more of the, um, the dust 
um, glowing in the infrared. And you can see, um, and that dust helps to trace uh, some of that dark molecular gas. So that molecular gas is cold enough that it doesn't really glow in the infrared, but we can see other tracers um, that help us identify that gas. And, um, and as we zoom in, you um, start again to see um, that central um, cluster. Now, when we go back and look at this um, with the Hubble Space Telescope, again, here's that central cluster, and then here is part of um, that gas. And there's a lot more gas that's um, not quite visible that um, wasn't covered by Hubble. But what we're seeing is a um, very dense cluster of stars um, that have formed out of that molecular cloud. And amongst these stars are a bunch of really uh, massive stars. So this is um, one of the places where, um, in our galaxy that has lots and lots of massive stars. These stars, um, their UV radiation and the winds um, have basically excavated out this entire cavity. So everything that you see out um, extending from the central cluster has been um, blown out by the radiation and the energy, the winds from those central stars. And you can see that there are literally thousands of stars um, located in the central cluster. And there are also lots of stars out here, but the red stars are the ones that were imaged um, using um, infrared, whereas these bluer stars are ones that are visible in visible light. And what this means is that all these blue stars are ones that um, are probably um, just in the foreground, meaning they're actually between us and this cloud and this cluster. And all the reddish stars and the yellow stars are the ones that um, are s still somewhat um, embedded in the cloud. And, and, and so you have to go into the infrared to see them. Now what I'll do is we'll zoom in. And I, I don't know this region. Um, very well, so I can't tell you which ones are the supermassive stars, but there are at least five so-called um, wolf rayet stars, which are um, just um, very close to going supernova. And so um, this is, you know, within a million years or, or, or so or, or less, um, the a lot of those massive stars will have exploded, and they will have completely disrupted and changed um, this cloud. Um, and you can literally see how many um, little tiny red dots there are. And all these, star um, these red dots are ones that are still somewhat in embedded in the cloud. And you can even um, see along here that you know, there are places where it looks like the, uh, that high temperature gas bubble, that 10,000 degree bubble, has reached. But there are places that are still very, very dark. And so there are places in the cloud that are still so dark uh, because there's so much obscuring gas and dust that we are really not seeing through it, um, even in um, the mid-infrared. Now we're looking at other um, features, and you know, remember that the um, the cluster is over here, and you can see that you have lots of shapes that point back towards that cluster, and so this again is evidence of the winds and the UV radiation from those stars. They're blasting from this direction. And they are literally blowing out and destroying the molecular gas. And the regions, these little trunk-like things that stick out, are places where the gas is dense enough that they haven't been completely de destroyed yet. But you know, give it some time. Within a few thousand years, these trunk-like stru structures will probably have um, disappeared or will have changed um, quite a bit. And then you can also still see lots of little red dots. So those are all... Um, relatively young stars. Um, and then here is yet another region, and we're seeing fewer red dots, but more foreground stars. And so, um, you know, it's really hard to say exactly what's going on, um, but you can see the interesting problem astronomers have. Um, you're looking at this region, and there's probably lots of things that are piled up on top of each other, and you have to sort of try and figure out um, what's in the foreground and what's in the background based on um, your different observations. And then finally, um, I just um, wanted to show another region with lots of the, um, the little um, red protostars. And one of the um, earlier papers um, that I cited, um, they did a count and showed um, well over 5,000 um, um, young, young stars in this region. So 
Um, but this is um, pretty typical of um, large star forming regions where you have many thousands of stars all forming at once. So with that, I'm done with my stories and I'll be happy to answer questions about these at the end, but I'll we'll hand the mic off to Steve. <laughs>